and welcome to Burning Questions by Arts Equator. My name is Nabila Said. Uh, I am the editor of artsequator.com. Uh, but firstly, some important announcements, especially for those who just joined us in the last few moments. Um, if you're in the Zoom session with us today, we request that you do keep your video and audio off. Um, now, this, the reason why is because this session is being live streamed to the community on howround.com which is a theatre commons um, that has a worldwide presence. So we are actually also joined today by a worldwide audience, which we are very excited um, about. And of course, in the Zoom, in this Zoom session as well, I'm sure there are people who are um, from different parts of the world and not just in Singapore. Um, this session is also being recorded and the video will be made available later on. So if any of your friends could not join us, you can let them know that they can catch this um, later on. So for those of you who are new to us, Arts Equator is a regional digital media platform that is dedicated to covering the arts in Singapore as well as the rest of Southeast Asia and the world. Um, and we publish original articles, podcast videos, photo essays, um, illustrations, uh, and we work with a pool of uh, writers and content creators in Singapore as well as um, uh, worldwide as well. Um, now, you can also find us at artsequator.com. If any of you have never gone to our website before, we'll appreciate uh, you if you want to check it out, you know. Um, but speaking of the equator, uh, this new series of talks that we're doing is called Burning Questions. Um, and Burning Questions actually offers a space for regional voices um, to dialogue and discuss some of the kind of like big questions that are facing the arts community right now uh, during this time when we're all affected by COVID-19. And we've seen how like within just a few short months, um, which have felt very, very long, the way that we make experience and consume the arts has uh, radically changed and exposed, uh, and also exposed the extreme pre precarity of the art sector as well. Um, Burning Questions is actually a series of four talks, uh, which um, of, the, of which today's one is actually the first. So we do thank you for joining us for this first of this new series. Um, and this series is supported by Splice Lights On, with live stream support by HowlRound TV. Today, I welcome you to join us uh, for the first um, in this series. So it's called Tech in Performance, The Great Leveler or The Great Unequalizer? So that's our burning question for today. And before I hand you over to um, our moderator, Felipe Silvera, and the speakers in this session, uh, just a short note. So um, at the end of the session, we will be having a Q&A. And uh, we request that if you are in the Zoom session, you can actually put your questions in the live chat. So that's where we're gonna be looking uh, at your questions uh, through the chat in the Zoom. For those of you watching this on the live stream, you can actually put your questions into the Facebook chat on HowlRound's Facebook. And we will try our best to address as many questions that we get today, um, time permitting, of course. If not, we will try to address them maybe at the, after the session um, on our platforms. Uh, so uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Um, maybe if anyone kind of like missed the first part of what I just said, there are some Zoom instructions at the bottom of this slide that we have on right now. So we do ask you to do um, put on those, uh, follow these instructions for the best viewing experience. Uh, I'll now leave you in the capable hands of uh, Philippe. Thank you, Navila. Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us in this first uh, session of Burning Questions. My name is Felipe Cervera, and I am a lecturer in theater at La Salle College of the Arts here in Singapore. I'll just introduce the session, our speakers, and then we'll just get going. Using technology in performance isn't new, but COVID-19 has forced more artists to explore the digital medium, dealing with lag, latency, and liveness, while rethinking audience engagement and accessibility. Are we witnessing a new renaissance? in the performing arts or an undoing? Is digitalization a boogeyman or something that really deserves a greater conversation? What infrastructures become new in this new turn towards the new normal? Which ones become obsolete? Who stops being part of the art making process and who is no longer part of the team? We have three wonderful speakers today, and I'm really excited to be joining uh, them in conversation. Our first panelist, Madeline Flynn, is an Australian artist who creates unexpected situations for listening. Her work is presented and awarded, and awarded widely. She has recently toured uh, 
various international festivals of great prestige that include the Satoshi Triennale in Japan, the Theater del Welt in Germany, the Brighton Festival in the United Kingdom, Asia Topa in Australia, and the Anti Festival in Finland. Hi, Madeline, great to have you here. Our second speaker is Brandon Tay, who is a media artist based in Singapore who explores the uncanny and the sublime through a mediated lens. His practice spans the moving image, mediated sculpture, and audiovisual performance with a background in film and animation that informs this multifaceted practice. His work is widely shown locally in Singapore and very much touring internationally around Asia. Hi, Brendan. And our last speaker, Elizabeth Cow, is the artistic director of Thereabouts, a site-specific performance company whose work aims to position sites and spaces as a focal point for performance. Meanwhile, she also works as a producer on various projects of, of uh, video production, live events, and live performance. And she's also a solo artist that has recently performed her piece Method Hominid at the Substation Gallery in April 2019. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. <laughs> Very well. So for those of you who are joining, uh, we thought that there's, there are three big angles for this conversation. And the way we're going to proceed during the next hour and a half is that we're going to be moving through these angles, through these big points in, in, in the topic. And then, I, then we'll open the floor for your questions and, and, and for more discussion. Please feel free to type your questions on the chat and we'll make our best to address them in the Q&A. If by any chance we can't address them, do drop them, uh, do write them as a message on the Facebook page of Arts Equator and we'll make our best to facilitate it. Um, so the first big topic, well, I'll just speak of the three, three big angles so you all know what, what it is. In previous conversations among the panelists and myself, we thought that there are three big angles. The first one is the aesthetic or the philosophical. The second one is the infrastructural. And the third one is the social. So we'll proceed addressing these three. To kick things off, um, I'll just ask our panelists to introduce a bit more about their work and then share a bit more on how has their practice changed in the last six months. Have you experienced any artistic crisis or big change in the form of your output in your everyday? Let's start with Madeline. Thanks, Felipe. Um, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm based here in Melbourne uh, or NAM, and uh, I'm honored to live on the land of the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders who are past, present, and future. Um, and I've been here. This is where I've been. <laughs> Um, and uh, since since March, and actually for me and Tim, who's my partner and who I work with, um, that's a very unusual for us to be in one place uh, at in our place in our home studio for this long. So that's you know a very practical, massive change that's happened. Um, they're big questions, right, Felipe? So I guess to say, um, I'll just give you a little bit um, of to try and give a sensibility of our practice. Um, so my background and training is in music and sound. And embedded within those things of music and sound, of course, are ideas of collaboration and time. Um, and through those um, techniques and interests, uh, we develop a whole set of different works and different engagements with materials, techniques, technologies, industries, and community. So they, they take all sorts of form. I might, I might just, for example, talk about one work that um, is, and partly because I think it's a work we won't be able to do again, um, together here about those, uh, I guess there's sort of these um, letting goes, these feelings of letting go of the sort of work that we've done in the past, perhaps. 
Um, so there's, I'll tell you about this work we've got called Pivot. And uh, it was commissioned by a festival in Australia about two years ago. And it's a field of, uh, we call them semi-intelligent, but they're artificially intelligent seesaws. Um, so they're quite large public sculptures. Um, people can ride them. They're aluminium. They're sort of um, and they pop up in different places. And uh, the artificially or semi semi intelligent aspect of them is that people talk to the seesaw and the seesaw talks back. And uh, so uh, that's basically built in a in a in a program and open source, it's not open source actually, but it's free, um, program called Dialogue Flow, which is essentially like you're just writing a chatbot, but you write the library of responses. So what that means is it becomes this, uh, it becomes this massive literary with, because uh, so we can write the, the, all the text, all the possibilities that can happen in that conversation. Um, so it's a game, it's quite absurd, it's sometimes serious, it's quite poetic. Yeah, all, people can engage in it in all sorts of different ways. Um, she, she speaks, I call her a she. Uh, there's a lot of things we can talk about there, about the, I guess, the techno-feminist um, perspective on, on the vocal timbre of artificial intelligence or of the assistant. Um, but... Uh, so at least at the moment in about 35 languages. Um, so that work has been in several different places in the world. And um, it's a work where people have to touch an object, right? They have to sit on it. They have to hold it. Usually in a season, thousands of people would, would interact with it. Um, so... At the moment, that work is sitting over there in my studio in a big series of crates. And I can't see how that work is going to make sense um, for people, for audiences, for places, um, for, the, for the future that I can see at the moment. Um, Felipe, could you ask me what, could you tell me what one of the other questions was? Well, let's let's just let's just unpack that. So, why can, can you just elaborate more? Why do you think that this piece is worth like highlighting in the current context? Is it because of interaction? Is it because of its mobility? Mm. And also, would you would you say that then these two these two aspects of performance and this more so an, an installation more than theater, right? Um, would you say that these two aspects are something that comes under pressure when measures, measurements like social distancing or mm. lockdowns come into place? Yeah, um, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. It's uh, the question of mobility. Um, I mean, this was already a question for me. Like for, for all of us, I, I feel in this time, you know, what gets revealed is uh, the problems and instabilities that were already there right so already this question for me of being of living in a country and moving heavy materials around the world this is not sustainable in any sense so already that was there as a question um, but uh, so so yes mobility uh, you know obviously very particularly I'm here right in where I am here we, we are looking at, uh, so we're back in a lockdown state here. Um, we are looking at perhaps going to the most severe lockdown in which we can only move 100 metres away from our houses. So we're at a tipping point like that at the moment, which is already pushing Australians aren't allowed to leave this country and at, to, at the moment until October um, and limiting the people who can come here as well. Um, so, yes, I'm yeah. not, we're not going anywhere, right? Well, uh, I, think, I think it's important that we pin this thought and maybe we can move on to Brandon, but I think it's important mm -hmm. to pin this thought because in the, you know, the latest conversations or the, the general conversation about the, the more philosophical impact of, on, of COVID on performance 
is yes. greater than liveness. And I don't think we have spoken very much about mobility. And yes. mobility in the sense of how theater and performance, you know, within the global economy and the creative economy uh, are supposed to be traveling and that is not happening. So how does that, mm. what, what, not only at the level of the economy, but also how do we think through the lack of mobility of performance and what, does, what can we learn out of that immobility, that, out of that stagnancy? And also yeah. to broaden up the sense of liveness, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that the conversation is not just about the immediacy of synchronicity, but also the, the mediation of traveling. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's just pin that thought and maybe as, as, we, as we progress, we can also come back to, 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 that, mm -hmm. to that point. Thank Brandon, how are you? Hi, hi, Felipe. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I guess like, um, oh, like I probably some uh, introduction about myself and what I do. Um, in this context or in this uh, circle of, um, for this audience, I think I'm probably best known for uh, my collaborations with uh, other artists in a kind of like a multimedia aspect. Um, what a dated word, right? But um, like uh, I kind of design kind of a interactive uh, animated systems that are uh, for performance. So I, the last, the Last two ones that I've been working on uh, with Choi Ka Fai have been uh, um, Cosmic Wonder Taiwan and Unbearable Darkness, and before that, um, Dance Clinic. So um, this year was supposed to be quite a busy year for us, and but unfortunately, because of COVID, um, a lot of stuff have been postponed to the second half of the year. And that's been my experience so far. So I kind of spent the first half of the year having a very strange relationship with time. So that was very, very um, kind of um, not disruptive, but interesting to kind of see that like my perception of time or my experience of time has become very different. My sleep cycles have changed and the things that I was doing in that time was different. Um, I guess the thing for me that like I've been thinking about most during this time or this period was uh, like you mentioned, uh, Felipe, what uh, questions about presence and agency. Um, and the kind of thoughts that have been occupying me have been about um, like, what are we trying to do uh, with the mediums or the technology that we have available? And whether that are we bringing our old paradigms into new forms? Hmm. So I would think that like the the kind of uh, metaphor analogy I, I, I keep going back to when I see um, kind of archive performance or like Zoom based uh, theater performances is that like, it's kind of like watching um, that transition between theater to film. But um, I think there's something about like the technology that we're using right now that we can kind of um, utilize and it has to be a different kind of like, like set of tools um, and it has to kind of um, give some agency to the viewer as a participant in order for it to feel that there is some form of liveness um, and I think to that end I've been thinking about like you know what what kind of systems or what kind of tools I can build for this kind of work and kind of transition away from working purely within the stage or within a, a, a gallery into something that can exist like a in an online space without referencing a previous form or, or referencing a previous medium in a representational or or try to get something back from that but have you experimented with anything specific uh, i think like a lot of what i'm doing now is actually trying to figure out uh how to apply the logic of games hmm. or like uh to a live context and by gaming i mean uh not only like digital video games, but also tabletop games or like uh, games with multiple participants. So I think what might be interesting is to kind of work around that. So yeah, I've just been experimenting with thinking through and like um, okay. plotting out like different models that might be interesting. Thanks, More Brandon. conceptual models so than technical ones, I guess. Thanks, Brandon. So just pinning things and begin constellating ideas of the conversation. We have mobility and you bring to the table aspects of collaboration and how uh, the ways in which collaborations that were supposed to happen 
in mobility now are, now are happening remotely. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, that also affects the, the form is content, right? So that also affects the, the artistic intelligence that is being invested into, into the piece. And also something that I think is super important is this point on agency. Um, and I think that also something that has been gone missing in the conversations is that we just, in, in, in using Zoom or video conference software as a stopgap solution, we also just assume that that's not necessarily uh, political in the sense of gathering a community or assembling the people, right? Assembling the, the, the audience. Um, so I think that the point on agency is super important also to highlight uh, and maybe ask to what extent are we thinking the agency or we're just obviating as if we as if this digital turn doesn't have the agency that we suspect it might have. Um, so, you know, we, we have these ideas already on the table. I'll just go to Elisa and then maybe we can just engage in a bit more brainstorming before uh, we can proceed. Elizabeth, how are you? Hi, hello, I'm good. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Um, as Felipe mentioned, I'm the artistic director of Thereabouts. So it was formerly known as Thereabouts Theatre, um, but now it's called Thereabouts um, simply because um, I don't think we're just doing like site-specific theatre. Um, we're just we're doing site-specific performance. Um, so for Thereabouts, we are very focused on putting sites and spaces as the focal point of a performance. Um, and for that, our creation process means that we make the discovery and exploration of these sites as a priority in conjunction with uh, various social political narratives, uh, human experiences, uh, and even the politics of its architecture or its place or its inhabitants, uh, if there are any. Um, for me as a producer, uh, in the last year, I've been doing quite a lot of video and film production um, and recently uh, live streaming as well. Um, so I've always been interested in marrying uh, live streaming experiences and technology with performance. Um, when I was in university, I uh, experimented with it in my final year. Um, I actually, in addition to Metal Hominid, I did another show called Tiak Kantang, uh, which is about cultural hybridity. Um, and when I came back to Singapore, I streamed it live on Facebook. And I had audiences interact with me live on Facebook. And I found that uh, very intriguing because I felt like a lot of it, it, it gave a lot more people access to my performance. Um, I really like the idea of live streaming in performance because I think that it, it amplifies your audience um, instead of just being within four walls of a theater or of a physical space. Your audience is now this huge place called the internet. Um, there are like billions of people on the internet and um, you can share the same moment over and over again. And it's been crystallized and cocooned in this thing called a video or a live stream, you know, and people can come and watch it again. And I find that very interesting, um, especially with, with, as a theater maker, you know, we always talk about how like every moment of performance is, is unique or the same moment can never happen twice, you know, even if you are, say, performing a Shakespearean play four nights for four nights and it's the same play, you know, nothing is ever the same. Whereas if you were to put something online, it's there forever. It doesn't change unless you change it. And very rarely you do unless, you know, you have the prudence to take it down for some reason. Um, yeah. So I think that's um, something that I've been trying to toy with. Uh, in terms of site-specific performance. Um, I think in terms of like the, the last six months, I felt, yeah, I felt I've had a lot more time to really think about that. I actually took a bit of a break from, from creating site-specific work simply because of my commitments with video production um, and also COVID. But I felt it was a really good break because, um, because the work in video production and live streaming the demand for it obviously has increased, um, but at the same time, while this demand and all these questions about it has increased, for those who are the technicians or on the back end of live streaming, we are scrambling to find solutions for all of these things. Um, and as a performance maker, it's it's very it's it's not just frustrating, but it's it's very um, I think it's very emotionally draining to really think about. Um, all these issues because 
because you're so used to to having this certain expectation of what performance should be you know you have that physical presence of the audience and you're physically present in the place where you want to perform whereas right now we have to imagine ourselves um in this screen and then we have to also then try and put our our position in the position of the person watching on the other end and there's a lot of things that can happen in between even though when even though there isn't like a physical thing blocking us there's this virtual barrier of sorts um and then you have to grapple with things like latency and you have to grapple with different vocabularies as well um i've spoken to like a few uh friends and colleagues who do performance work and when when we try when i try to explain to them like different ideas of performance it's like huh and then you use different like technical vocabularies like encoding or latency and uh live streaming and platforms and it's just yeah i feel it's like a whole new world but not so new because i feel that there's a crossover because we've already been living with this technology for about 10 years yeah okay. or more i'm just yeah. going to like bring things together i think that elizabeth what i'm really attracted of what you're saying is there is an intersection there between the politics of place in site specific performance and live streaming right yes uh mm -hmm. which you know if you think about it their live streaming is also site specific you are you know in 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 its own way um so yeah. maybe we can start with like tying the dots there so there are what are, what what in your sense are the new politics of the site specificity of your work and i'm tying here the point of mobility that madeline is bringing the point of collaboration and also the point of agency that brendan was was bringing up so how what are the the politics and aesthetics of these new site specific i mean you know like mm -hmm. you I'm, i'm i'm being quite site specific here and you guys too yeah uh, so yeah. how do we think through this i think if um okay if we go back to like what most people expect site specific work is uh, okay I, i mean everyone has different expectations of certain definitions of genre and theater um but for me i would say like site specific work is where you put um a site as a focal point. So for example, if I were to live stream for example a protest, which I did personally when I was back in London, if I were to live stream a protest um and I want to I mean not that I did make it to a performance work, but if I wanted to make it into performance work about political agency in the time of Brexit, for example, um I think you could in a way call that site specific because you are using instead of bringing the audience to the site you're bringing the site to the audience I think that's one way you can see it and mm. if we were to take virtual space as a site if you were to take even virtual reality VR as a site um I'm not sure what the extent of it is but I see it as like a huge a huge almost unending platform and plane on which we can create different way we put meaning to space and to site um you know different narratives like what is who we are as people what creates our identity where in these virtual spaces do we feel at home um then you also take into the account all the narratives and personal histories of people who find a lot of solace on online spaces and uh online mediums or virtual mediums um yeah so and i think to tie that in with like agency and mobility i think um the online space is something that that um we're just beginning to to scratch the surface and crack the code on on how to use this this place slash medium slash function um as a means of of developing personal agency or public agency um and also as a means of mobility because i think um with with the invention of the internet people have access to expose themselves to other audiences across continents and have access to other content from around the world um yeah so i think that's something that uh, we shouldn't be afraid to tackle yeah Yeah, what are your thoughts in 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 this point, uh, Madeline and Brendan? Uh, 
uh, I'm really interested. Uh, I keep, I, I've been really thinking about the dissonance of this time, like this, the cognitive dissonance of what it means in, in many different ways in this time, but specifically if we think about sight, um, for me, there's this dissonance of, I am here, I, this absolute place. And I actually, I, I always choose to show where I am because I feel as if that's, for me, that makes sense about helping me locate myself in where I am. And also because I'm seeing myself, right? I'm getting this reflection back. Um, so, so there's this sense of this is, this is my hyperlocal. I am totally in my hyperlocal. And I imagine um, as for other people, there's been, um, I have a very strong local community and a lot of mutual aid has happened within walking distance or riding distance in my community. So um, there's a very strong hyperlocal like that. And then, then uh, in my virtual communities, of which, as Liz said, we already had, right? We already had virtual communities and we already used these platforms. Um, they were already part of our lexicon. Um, so I think what's happened is this sort of massive expansiveness of the virtual communities that we're in. Um, the sites of them have their, um, I've been really enjoying their different sort of like, they like to have these different tonalities the, of, of, or timbres in these different groups that I'm existing in um, and that we're all existing in. And so in that way, they have a, a specificity of their site within these virtual chambers that we're making. Um, uh, yeah, that's my response. Hyperlocality, I'll come back to that point. Uh, love it. Brendan, <coughs> thoughts? Um, yeah, I guess like for me, um, when it comes to doing, uh, when, when I think about site in terms of performance in the digital, uh, what I think about is uh, like a, being situated in time rather than in space. Uh, for example, like, I mean, when we are, we are all like being uh, situated in time in this, in, this, in this chat as well, or in this uh, forum. And I think that's something that, um, like would be uh, applicable in terms of how to think about what translates in performance from the stage to this. Uh, but like, uh, uh, but um, what I thought was interesting was that uh, if you are using a tool such as Zoom, there is a ability of for the for the people, let's say even in the chat right now, uh, to engage in the performance. And maybe there's a new kind of like uh, process or a new kind of uh, way of thinking about what this is, uh, as opposed to like what we traditionally think of like a performance. I think that is something that would be really interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. And, and I love that much of what we're saying is also mirroring the comments on the chat. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll address those comments in a moment, which I also think Chris and Rich, and thank you very much for those. Um, but on the point of hyperlocality, I think that, you know, in a way, the economy is deglobalizing, but performance practice is at, at probably its, its most global moment. And, and, you know, Zoom or other infrastructures have leveled the playing field, and our, our outputs are mostly at the same level of offer of outputs that have heavy colonial or heavy hegemonic weight like the National Theatre of the UK. And I think that that's also some, some, something important to note. Um, and on the point of hyperlocality, I think that, that this is an excellent point that more than, I mean, we're experiencing a performance in multiple hyperlocalities and multiple synchronicities. And that's weird, right? Uh, there's a hyperlocality of my room meeting your room and seeing my face. And there's a hyperlocality of the chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thank you. I think that, uh, I, I'm, you know, just to have a macro view, I'm, I'm really glad that we didn't speak about liveness just for the sake of liveness in these first 20 minutes of the conversation. I think that there's so much more that we can begin to talk about in, in how performance is being made in lockdown and during the pandemic. I want to move the conversation a bit forward because I'm mindful of time and I want to address these comments of 
of, 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 our, of our audience. And I want to begin to speak about the infrastructural level of what we're saying. We've spoken about the philosophical and the big concepts, but how is this actually being made? So, you know, we know that the history of tech in performance goes way beyond simply using video conferencing softwares now, right? Tech in performance are, is, 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 is something, performance needs tech, and in many ways, performance is a technology. Uh, but more specifically, the question is, what do you appreciate are the things that we have forgotten about this history of tech in performance? And similarly, what new things are coming at an infrastructural level? What are the new infrastructure, what infrastructures we stop using? And we, what infrastructures are we using now that we didn't quite appreciate to be in the network that makes a performance possible? Let's begin with Brandon this time around. Um, so by, by definition, uh, by infrastructure, uh, what, what did you mean? Well, you know, uh, what sustains the structure, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. to give you an example, right now, this call is being facilitated by transoceanic cables as much mm -hmm. as a vast mm -hmm. satellite network. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, what, I mean, that, that's just from the top of my head, but okay. we should also be using the aircon that is in our rooms and we should mm -hmm. also be using like, <clears throat> You know, it's not only the centralized aircon in the theater. Now, you know, we're 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 experiencing four different climates. Mm. Right. Okay. Uh, I guess maybe like uh, I would like to say that maybe uh, in terms of the tools that we might be transitioning to, uh, the I I don't think like a tool that like such as Zoom that's uh, supposed to be created for uh, online webinars or like. Um, like group chats is the best tool that we could possibly make. Um, and there's an element of like that it's anybody's guess at the moment about what tool to transition to or what's the most effective way. And I think like there is an opportunity for both performers and technologists to kind of figure out what each other want and what they can, they can, what they can offer. Um, like, I think the most important thing is uh, for me is like how um, like in terms of archival, right? Like a performer, a performance uh, uh, performance is archived on a video and played endlessly. Uh, first of all, it's not live, and second of all, it's a video. So there is an element that doesn't uh, translate in terms of like variability in um, how a performer tries to to deliver in something that's like hyper local hyper localized and specific so um i think that's the first thing that infrastructurally that we have to kind of think about like how to situate the performer in the in the space and time and also uh create financial support that their image or a database or a, a isn't like used to kind of replicate or represent another version of themselves. Um, one interesting thing that I kind of thought would be the wrong way of doing it is like, for example, now we can use uh, AI and uh, GPT-2, which is a text generation AI, mm. to kind of like create articles or narratives based on the voice of a source text. So uh, that's thinking speculatively like, in the near future, I mean, we'll be able to kind of like create videos of performances without an actor present just from the archives. So like, I think it's really important that we try, as we transition into digital that we create equity for performers for their time and also technicians. Mm -hmm. And I think all the elements for creating this is there. Like we do have a blockchain system. We do have like protocols and, and software to do all this. It's just about a matter of adoption. So I think that's something that uh, both technologists and performers have to both have some discussion about. That's great. Thanks, Brandon. I'll come yeah. back to the point on, on the tech crew at the end. Um, Madeline, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think about the, the infrastructures that we need, Felipe, for me are agreements like their inf uh, um, ways of uh, that we share an agreement of what we're doing together. So I think that's a key 
infrastructure, actually. Um, I'm a big fan of Gia Tolentino um, and her, um, my, first, my first reading actually in um, lockdown time was her Trick Mirror uh, book of essays. Recommend it to everybody if you haven't come across it before. Uh, she's a, an amazing writer and thinker. Um, she's a Filipino American writer. Um, and she's got this thing that she says about the thing and the representation of the thing and that we get confused and we uh, accept the representation of the thing for the thing. Um, and so she's just asking us, I think, to separate out these two threads of and to make sure that we have an awareness about our connection to a thing and a representation of a thing. Um, and so for me, what was exciting, because certainly that uh, her writing is not specifically to do with uh, arts and artistic life and culture, um, but to know that the, those key ideas that actually sit within performance, right, for us about representation of something and the something, actually that's something that we're really expert in this abstract space and a way of negotiating these separate ideas to create a new third space in a way. That's what we know how to do as artists. Um, so uh, anyway, that's, that's my... That's my answer, Felipe. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like, I, I love the idea of infrastructure of agreements. Um, yeah. And, yeah. you know, like just, it, it's both agreements between the people that are going to do the thing, but also being in agreement with the tech, right? Like, yes, yes, uh, yes. There was, there was a moment in, 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 in your intervention that this, the sound lagged. And, you know, that was a moment in which technology did not agree with what was going on. And that's, that's also, it pivots me to think that we, we may be too, too accustomed to the transparency of technology in performance. Like we just hope that everything works, but, you know, these, these kinds of things really evidence the extent to which technology sometimes oh, agree oh my god i mean certainly i i imagine with for the other artists too but any you know working in tech and art it's like you have to, it's designed to fail you always have to know you know that it's going to fail right it is so so the failure has to be built into the project that's all yeah you said what do you think mm, i think um I think um, Brendan and Madeline touched on two things that um, I think are quite important. Um, agree, like the idea of like everyone needs to be in agreement of what's happening. Um, the tech needs to, the tech also needs to to work for us. But I think we also need to talk about like the ethics of of this sort of placing of of work online, and then also um, that balance of of tech and human effort i guess um because because i think maybe what if at the end of the day um all you need is just one person to do a performance of eight or seven characters because you have things like a motion capture you have cgi you have ai as brenda mentioned um and as Madeline mentioned yeah, yes like tech is is definitely meant to fail, it is doomed to fail because it doesn't improve on itself unless, you know, you, you, we get to a stage where we can finally create um, uh, computer systems that can rebuild themselves or that can program themselves, you know, and fix their own bugs. Uh, <laughs> but at the end of the day, yeah, it's, it's, it's that now it's, it's a new chicken and egg thing, you know, um, does tech come first or does <laughs> human come first? Um, what makes artwork more important now? Is it um, how magnificent it is done through tech or how magnificent the idea of the artist is that they have this, this decided to incorporate tech or decided to rely on tech to make their ideas and their concepts come alive um, instead of on human people. 
um, I think that's something that um, I think is 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 very um, exciting to think about. Um, it might sound a little bit like nihilistic, but I think it's very exciting to think about having to just completely do work um, with just codes, screens, and um, technology, or just a whole suite of Adobe. Um, and then like, you know, you just create a performance just with just After Effects and sort of, um, yeah, because people are a bit, I think people of my generation maybe um, might be a bit more like sanitized to performances created by computers. Yeah. Even though, yeah, the live, yeah, sorry. Go on. No, I, I, just, I just want to highlight that question. Like, um, what is the benchmark to, 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 to evaluate a piece of art now? You see it? And you I, just exactly, invite you to yeah. repeat that question that you had. I think that is brilliant, right? Yeah, so I think, yeah, and that's, and that's also another question with, with ethics as well. So then, like, as a performer, performance maker and, um, and for and for um, policymakers and uh, bureaucrats working in um, you know for for arts councils uh, across the world, like how where do they draw the line for themselves, or where do they draw the line across the industry? Um, you know, to what extent to what extent is a performance great or of or, or noteworthy um, when it comes to incorporating technology? Yeah. Seeing as, as Felipe, as you said, like technology has been a part of performance, I would say since the beginning, since performance began in Greece, you know, technology has been around, but you didn't see Aristotle or you didn't see uh, Euripides getting um, awards for the best use of pulleys in their performance, you know, or, or fire. Um, but now you've got um, performances that are just noteworthy because of the amount of tech used in it. Or yeah, the but, fact that it's completely VR, yeah. There's also this thing of tech in performance, like you know the the, the infrastructure, what makes an a like performance happen, and also the artistry of tech, right? How arty the the artist is in using whatever technology. So it's not only what enables AI, but how do you as an artist pose a relationship with AI or with whatever other technology? Mm -hmm. I'm conscious of time, and there's plenty of stuff in here. We have questions from the audience. Uh, maybe at the end we can just wrap this up, but you know this is already really a great map of ideas. We have uh, ideas of mobility, collaboration, hypermobility, hyperlocality, the need for archival tech, lo locating the performing the performer in times of space, infrastructures of agreement, uh, evaluation of performance artistry in relation to new technologies. So we're, we're, there's a bunch of stuff there that we will need a few sessions to unpack. But let's move on to the last point. And I think we're already more or less reaching out to it, which is a social point. Earlier on, uh, Brandon, you mentioned how there is some awkwardness between the transition of theater, of theater as a concept to film as a concept and that weird encounter between broadcast media and television and theater. Uh, and we have also spoken of the infrastructure uh, aspect to this. But what about the social? How, who who in your teams is no longer with you? Mm -hmm. um, and just to give a bit more context, and you know, I mentioned yesterday when we when we planned this session that for me this panel is missing a, a, a technical director. This panel is missing a a, 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 a fly operator, right? Um, I mean, just salute to to our to our colleagues of you know we lost our jobs as artists, but those guys lost seasonal staff in theaters around the world are no, there's no back, there's no safety net for them. Um, so f we know that we know that, that one of the greatest impact of COVID on theater and performance is that the tech crew are no longer, or most of them are no longer needed. And that's, that's a deep social impact. But that's just the context that I want to ask this question. In your practice, what collaborators are you not engaging anymore? And what collaborators now you find yourselves having to engage with? I think or are you the um, has, has, has there not been a change? Um, for me, I think the, 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 the people who are missing are people like front of house staff and performance assistants. Um, for my past few projects with thereabouts, um, I incorporate 
performance assistance and front of house staff for you know to help facilitate the flow of audience from, from within the, within a, a large site. Um, I think that's something that yeah it's lost. Um, I think that's one sad thing about about um, being excited and like moving on with like tech and performance. But it's that it's that I guess that's that's how I would would see the manifestation of liveness having that those people physically present for the audience to support that support both ways support the audience and and the the arts maker or the director of the performers yeah so i think that's one thing that that's missing and i think that also impacts on on um, passing on i guess um, your work to people who who are trying to to find new experiences so you know students or or people who are younger than me who want to know a bit more about site specific work um, and they and I need assistance so I get them to help me out um, yeah so I think that's one thing that 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 will become a gap I think because then I think um, maybe fresh graduates or young or young people who want to experience theater they, they, they won't get those opportunities to do that anymore um, because I remember like as a when I was um, a teenager having those opportunities available you know being able to assist in a performance or being able to be part of the performance making process as a front of house staff or assistant that was something that was a really good avenue for me yeah mm. yeah uh Madeline, your thoughts yeah so uh felipe i have very uh connected relationships with a whole set of different technical people as collaborators and I guess I would um, uh, I think about them like my cousins uh, and uh, so long relationships with lots of people and I guess what's happened here is that theatres are closed, public spaces are closed um, and as you say those people are often, often I employ those people Often I bring those people with me and they're part of my project. So what's happening now, and I'm, I'm just one person who many, many people are doing this, uh, um, artists who are starting to get, we're starting to get new commissions or we're starting to get creative development towards a presentation next year, that sort of thing. Then we're uh, bringing those people in to those conversations and the developing of, you know, the tech specs for something or the possible imaginary tech specs or the, you know, production schedule or um, a risk assessment, the things, bringing those people in a lot earlier actually than you normally would in a process. So, so they can be employed. Um, and also, so we can solve, I mean, it, it's, of course, as we all know, the earlier we are together, the better the solution is going to be. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a mutual aid and a mutual benefit there. So, so that's certainly, certainly um, one practical solution. No, that and, and of, risk assessments. I think that that's, that's, that's vital, yeah. right? Like we forgot about risk assessments. Uh, risk assessments. I love risk assessments. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm not, I, I don't have skill in risk assessment, but I love the process with the risk assessor because often I'll be making things that, uh, you know, aren't, um, aren't, uh, haven't been made before. So uh, there's a lot of things that uh, are part of that. Um, yeah, so yes. So that's a, that's a sort of pra very practical, pragmatic solution that we're dealing with here. And also, I guess the other side to say, I really respond to what Liz is saying about um, people who aren't, in our communities who aren't having the opportunity to engage with process and practice, which is normally what we would be doing. Um, and so what I've been doing and lots of other people too, um, is like, uh, I'm being like a sound whisperer. That's what I've been calling it because, because uh, so maybe it's like mentoring. I don't really like the word mentoring because why? Lots of reasons. It's got an imbalance, imbalance of power in it, actually. That's why I don't like it. Um, but so encouraging those people in online public spaces to reach out to me and say, tell me what you're working on. I'd love to see, let, book in, like, let's have a half an hour chat about what you're doing. 
uh, what funding are you applying for? Sure, I'll write you a support letter. So all that sort of mutual aid, there's a lot of that happening. Um, yeah. yeah, so as I imagine it's happening. That's mutual. great, Marilyn, thanks. Brendan? Yeah. Um, uh, what was the question again? What, how has your team changed? Who, who, who suddenly went missing? And oh, okay. who new member you have? Uh, well, like for us, like usually my my work uh, is collaborative, and I usually fulfill that technical aspect of uh, a production or a performance. Um, and like, so for me, adapting to this time has been about uh, figuring out like what the opportunities that everyone can have, like adapting to a new medium, and. Um, I guess like uh, one thing I wanted to say was that like like we now have like an opportunity where there are like uh, there's a more there's a plurality of spaces that we can kind of perform or have performances in with a much less um, much less budget to kind of create the things that we need to and therefore we can work with smaller teams maybe or with like a or leverage on the technology itself so. Um, that's more or less where I think the nature of the kind of work that I do for other artists is going to be mm. in creating more um, like self-contained performances in the virtual rather than creating something in a space mm. where there would be a whole different uh, there there will be a different infrastructure for that, and I think that's something that everyone can kind of think about doing. As they transition, as technicians transition into doing something else, that's when we don't know what the what's the future of the performance space going to be. Yeah, no, I think, and I, I, I think that I appreciate you including the the, the technical colleagues as also in a transition. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's also a question there of how I, how is artistic practice also taking care of of its back end, right, of its dark room. And how are we also not transitioning art for the art's sake, but also art for the infrastructure that makes it and for the people that make the art, right? Um, I mean, it would be impossible to think of the P of, you know, the, the, I, from the top of my head, it would be impossible to think of Robert Wilson. I'm, I'm thinking Robert Wilson because of the sheer size of the stage and the level of infrastructure he requires. It would be impossible to think of that level of performance without an army, and it's important that we take care of these of these colleagues as well. Um, so again, for you who are joining us, these are plenty of ideas. We have a lot on the table. We are surely not going to resolve everything that we have brought up, but it is really revelatory to me that we have all of these ideas and we have not mentioned the problem of whether some performance is life of mediated. And this is telling that beyond just force feeding performance into a new medium, there's so, so much more in here that we need to address. I'm going to begin shifting to the questions. Uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for those of you who have uh, typed your questions, please bring them on. Uh, so the first question is from Ri Chang. Has translating performance and interactive art into digital space changed the role of these art forms in society. What are your thoughts on that? Is that, is that what we're doing? I, I, I don't, are, we, are, we, are we translating it? I, I don't think we're translating it. I think we're creating something new because that's what we all know how to do. It's possibly the thing that we're the best at. So, and I feel as if you know, it's our responsibility as artists to be doing that. Yeah. Um, so sorry, that was just responding to the first part of the question. That's fine. What was the second part? <laughs> okay, it's getting late here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whether whether how, whether this change this transition to digital space changes the role of these art forms in society. I mean, just for example, right? The, the, the function of theater in society par excellence is bringing together a, a people to think together for a while, to see the same thing, right? Like have a similar experience mm -hmm. of 
of the world. Has that changed? I, I think the role is still the same. It's just different medium. It's like um, going to the going to the theater, as in like Esplanade Theater, and then going to a different theater, which is Cafe Cineplex. Um, you know, it's just it's just a different medium. So I I think um, yeah, I don't think the role changes. I I think now it's it's more important um, because. Now that everyone, most of the world is sort of cocooned in their own homes, um, having art online or having access to artistic experiences online is important for people to continue to stay connected to humanity, to their own humanity, without necessarily um, being stuck on, on a screen or even stuck with just seeing the same people all the time, or even thinking about being stuck in whatever country they're in if they are a bit more nomadic in nature. Yeah, I think so, I think so the role is magnified. Yeah. Performance is still about bringing people together, apart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have you ever heard of a hermit that became a performance artist or a performer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you will yeah. be surprised. You will surprised. Someone <laughs> could argue that that being a hermit is the performance piece. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, i have <laughs> thinking about um, thinking about you know why we make what we make and how we how we make it um mm. and and uh what's what's changing now is how we're making what we're making and why we're making it. what what do we need to be making like i i keep that's my question to to myself and to other artists who we're talking with about like what is it that we need to be doing now um and some people some people go uh think uh some people are fast some people are fast makers and some people want to make something now and do it now. And some people are slow and we know that full spectrum. So, um, and they're going, to, they're going to be different things that are going to come. I guess one thing I want to say, a personal example is, for example, at the moment, because um, the, this is an accessible space that we can be in where um, uh, I can be with all sorts of different people. Um, it's, that's made sense to me now. I'm making a work that's an online commission for somebody and I, part of it is investigating and including um, an alt text reader as an audio embedded device mm. for blind and low vision people, obviously, but also that it's just central to the process and the work itself. And to me, that makes sense as a work to be making now when many more of us are spending much more time online than uh, in, in, in intersection with each other in, in line, maybe for some people in new ways and other people familiar ways. Um, so, so it's like, okay, that makes sense to be thinking about now. And, you know, all the, all the people, all the artists, that's what we're doing, what, what makes sense to be thinking about now. Mm. Yeah, Brandon. I I think if uh, I'm on like uh, Madeline's spectrum, I definitely am a person who's like on the slower end to respond to what to do about the situation here. Um, there are many opportunities and there are many uh, kind of like gray areas to kind of uh, figure out, and I really want to take my time with it, and I think. Um, and I think it's uh, to translate performance from the physical to the digital, the translation process is not a rep representation or a replication or adaptation. I think that's something that I've already kind of feel that that's not going to work. Um, yeah, but the early days, and I think there's a long kind of journey to kind of figure out what exactly might be the case in the future. Just yeah. got to work out how to survive in the meantime, right, Grant? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think that, but it's also tricky, right? Because we are we are in a bit of an awkward moment between we are reacting to the emergency on and now like oh the emergency goes on, so now we have to plan ahead, yeah. and that planning is where everything is a bit weird. Um, so, next question. Digital work being created at the moment is now much more accessible to audiences that it might have previously been inaccessible to. 
what happens to that generosity care, whether intentional or not, when we return to physical spaces? How can we not return to business and usual in this respect? And I think yeah. this is a really important, important question because yeah. across the conversation we have been we have been developing a really keen awareness on the ethics of our practice in the current moment, right? So how do we how do we sustain these these dialogues? How do we? What are your thoughts there? Well, I think we have personal responsibility, right? I think it's a, it's a it's a key part of what we can do from our position as practitioners, and and what we do with. Um, our intersection with presenters and producers about bringing that right to the first conversation that we have with the presenter and a producer about who isn't here and, and how can we help them to be here? Um, how can we make an inclusive space? So, yeah, and, and I, feel, I feel hopeful that those conversations will be much easier than they might have been pre-pandemic. Yeah. Elizabeth, what do you think? Yeah, um, yeah. I think the idea of inclusivity is a lot is now um, more urgent um, than pertinent. You know, people used to. I I personally feel that the word inclusivity is just always thrown around a lot by um, community workers or art makers um, because it's something that is suddenly on everyone's radar. But I think with the idea of digital work and the yeah um, and applying an inclusivity lens to it um, that's something that um, we're thinking a lot harder about now and yeah like what Madeline said like I, I don't want people to stop thinking that hard about it anymore um, and then also um, making work more accessible um, to people across uh, outside of your your immediate audience sphere um, I hope I think I think people will hopefully start being more generous about it, um, even post pandemic, because I think people can see the direct, um, the direct impact of that generosity, um, simply with with a very simple and public metric like views. I think that's something that um, artists or people in general value that um, visibility, because I think now more than ever. Um, the, the 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 threat of invisibility is is very close to to people's hearts now um, of being swept under the rug or being washed over by by all the worries that everyone is thinking of um, yeah so I think that's one thing and then also monetizing mm. um, I think monetizing is 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 has always been an issue with artists um, and now that we've we've ventured more into the digital space. Um, hopefully to monetizing solutions mm. that are there are more they're more monetizing solutions rather than just ticket sales. Um, you know, maybe you have things like Patreon, you have uh, things like uh, Skillshare, um, you know, not just depending on ticket sales or or taking a gamble on crowdfunding. So and I hope then as a result, um, education institutions start thinking of that when, when they train artists or arts managers or producers or directors, you know, like it's not just about selling out a full house, you know, what other ways can you make things sustainable for yourself? Mm. And then when the survival needs to kick in, like something like now, you know, at least you're a bit more prepared than we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Brandon? Uh, yeah, I guess like maybe when we, talk about inclusivity, uh, there are kind of two kind of angles to look at it. Uh, I, I really like what uh, Madeline was mentioning before about how she was kind of like uh, creating this environment of mutual flourishing between the people that she normally works with. Mm. And like, uh, also I really respect that like uh, when, when people uh, or creators at this point of time are kind of being very generous with a, their digital work but um, I'm also wondering whether those two things are kind of mutually exclusive. Can you create a, a piece of work that is um, that beneficial or, or equitable to everyone who has created it or as well as also kind of uh, being generous to your audiences? Um, I think there's a model that we can kind of explore like 
from what Liz said, like with Patreon or kind of blockchain like related models. But the question of course is adoption and and how willing people are are to kind of take away or, or go away from like the convention of just, you know, I'm just gonna buy a ticket and then whatever happens after that, it's really up to the theaters. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I think we're, we're going to move to the last question. There's a question on the floor on how do you envisage a fair relationship between you and the machine and the audience. And there's also another question about how can we um, in, in, inform or have an impact on, on leaders at the policy level so as to guarantee that, you know, in these transitions that, that art also has a, you know, a social dimension and that people can transit and and art can be can remain inclusive. Um, so maybe we can just tie that in and ask to the panel, you know, what is coming across is that there, there is an agency in, in artistic practice at the moment itself that can be quite pivotal for whatever future comes post pandemic. Um, in, in, you know, at different levels, at the level of, of the aesthetics of performance and performance art, uh, in terms of agency, in terms of mobility, collaboration, right? There's something there about policy making to enable a, a, another way of agency, another way of impact. Um, there's also the infrastructure, infrastructural level. How can art be funded to, to warrant new technologies to be embedded into the process? And also some sort of social security because what some of the thing, one of the things that has really become evident is that there is you know, the moment that we have to transition into a crisis, half of the community falls through the cracks. So what, how, 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 what do you think, or how can we, or, you know, let's just daydream for a while, how would you envisage this new, or not, let's not call it new, but this activist approach to artistic practice in the, in the, in the, common, in the, in the, in the current moment? Um, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, Melin, go ahead. Thanks, Liz. Uh, so this feels like, in my experience, it's this possibly the most activated uh, uh, the arts community has been in this country around um, around engaging with political process. There's uh, always been some people uh, who engage with politics and policy development, um, but this, this period of time together has meant that, that that's become a huge swell and actually a huge self-education about how to do that and who are the key bodies and actually revealing the inequalities and the instabilities and or revealing all the precarities. And the other thing that's happened is an understanding in the arts of this shared precarity that we have with everybody in our culture who's a contract worker, everybody. Um, so, so there's this uh, building of uh, understanding, mutual understandings across different groups of people. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk uh, in Australia about universal basic income and one of the particular, one of the uh, smaller parties in the country is adopting it as a platform. Um, so, and a lot of talk about modern monetary theory actually. And uh, so the possibility of, the possibility of this instability leading to a massive cultural and political shift. I mean, we can hope, right? That's that's that, that but that that does feel like you know and and it's on the back of work of you know the back of work of people of 40 years we're talking about people who have been working in these spaces that now are being revealed and there's a if the time it's it's the time is now mm. so there's there's that there's that feeling here mm. Mm. Lisa, um, what you want to say um um i was going to say like i think um the, the idea of 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 um, uh, governments and like councils and policymakers um, thinking that the solution to all of this is getting artists to upskill 
um, I find that really ironic seeing that I don't I don't know the exact number but a lot of artists are very skilled people as it is already uh, very well trained and well educated so um, to me it doesn't make sense to promote that unless unless you really um, are either partially self-taught or have zero knowledge um, I think what what art leaders and policymakers need to do is to encourage more collaboration that doesn't require huge amounts of spending on travel, on touring. Um, not saying that touring and traveling is not important, but I think there needs to be um, a certain segment of funding that is dedicated to digital collaboration. Um, for example, like Brendan and Madeline, like you guys, work heavily with digital mediums that can also be, be done over the internet. Um, and there have been artists who have tried, who, ha who are collaborating over the internet even before COVID, um, or who have wanted to collaborate over the internet. And, um, and that brings back to the question of evaluation. You know, how do you evaluate um, the process of an artwork over a digital sphere when you have to do your self-evaluation reports and you have to answer to your funders and you have to um, justify and quantify and qualify the value of your work, you know? So I think that's something that, that policymakers and art leaders can look at. Um, wow. and, and I feel that um, in, in the wake of, of COVID-19 and everyone sort of trying to go into survival mode, um, people have suddenly become, for, 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 for me personally, I just felt, I just feel that, um, yes, all these communities are popping up but they're all becoming very insular. You know, certain groups of people are only talking to certain groups of people and certain groups of people are talking to other groups of people. So um, oh, how really? can, mm. I mean, that's how I feel. Yeah, yeah. that's how I feel personally. So um, like, a, like there's no specific demographic to these people, but I just feel that um, even though everyone across the board is trying to have more agency in terms of the policymaking process and the political process in relation to the arts industry, in Singapore, um, like Madeline said, like you said, that there are these different um, specific sites in online, and um, these have erupted in the Singapore industry. And I'm in a few of these sites, and they are very, very, very specific in terms of their tonality, in terms of the subject matter they talk about. And I feel that as a result, we have unconsciously put up these digital barriers um, and there isn't really much of a two-way conversation um, there is conversation it's not but it's not enough and I think and I feel that is something that is reflected at policy level and that is reflected in the kind of grants that are being put out in Singapore um, mm -hmm. yeah as, as, yeah that's how I feel mm. Mm -hmm. thanks Alicia Brandon uh, yeah, I guess like, I think one thing to realize about digitization uh, is sometimes they, uh, it leads to automation. So uh, in terms of like creating uh, jobs and roles for technicians or creators or, or even content, like even ideas and, and the depiction of objects or things like digitization might lead to that. So I think there's always a risk that like the more digital you are going, you are at some point, there's a possibility that you're making yourself obsolete. So um, I think there's a balance and some, and I think the more informed you are about like digital spaces as a creator or a technician or an audience, like the more proofed you are against like, um, like being irrelevant or being made irrelevant in times of crisis like this. Uh, I think like the rush shouldn't be towards like just pure digitalization, but making the human uh, essential within that digitalization process or the human experience. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great uh, note to end the panel. Thank you very much to the three of you. This has been a really rewarding conversation. Tons of ideas, tons of provocations, and we've covered really a wide array of angles to how to approach the question whether technology in performance in COVID times is the enabler or the disabler. And I think that 
you know, to wrap things up, I think that what we're coming here is that what matters most is how we relate to technology. Technology itself is not something that uh, is not transparent, is, is, is made. So we can think of our relationship to technology as a way to think through performance, through art, moving forward in the future of whatever post-COVID world might bring us. Thank you very much again. Thank you to you that joined us, that have very generously shared your thoughts, your ideas. There's also plenty of material to think through in the chat. I'm sorry that we didn't get to read all the questions or all the comments, but please feel free to continue the conversation via Arts Equator's Facebook or HowlRound's Facebook. Again, my name is Felipe Cervera. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Madeleine. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Arts Equator and the back end team that has been maneuvering all of this session. Thank you, uh, Denise. Thank you, Navila. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, BJ, also from HowlRound. Uh, that's it for tonight. Have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Thank actually, you. it's not done yet. I, I had some ending <laughs> remarks. Oh. I'm so go, sorry. Go for it, Nabila. Post. Yeah. Um, so for those of you, I hope you haven't left yet after Felipe's uh, effusive thank yous. Um, but I just wanted to share that um, this series is a continuing series. In fact, today is the first of um, the, 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 these talks called Burning Questions. And in fact, our next one is just next week. Uh, and the topic for that one is traditional arts. Is it the forgotten COVID casualty? And we are going to have some really interesting speakers. Um, we have a puppet master from Myanmar. We have Alina Murang, a musician from uh, Malaysia and Jacob Bohm from Australia. Uh, and it, it will be moderated by Dance Academy, uh, um, uh, Sultari Amin Fari as well. So I, we really hope that you guys can join us. Uh, all the information is on um, the artsycreator.com website as well as our social media spaces. Um, I also just quickly wanted to um, mention that we just uh, kind of launched our online reviewing course. So in, in terms of like uh, upskilling, if anyone is interested in reviewing and learning how to review, we are actually doing dedicated sessions on dance reviewing, theater reviewing and book reviewing as well. So um, please feel free to look at our pages and you know apply for these. And the courses are all free. Um, they are only open to Singaporean citizens and PRs because uh, they're commissioned by the National Arts Council. Um, so we hope we can check out uh, both the Burning Question series as well as our reviewing courses. Uh, but besides that, um, that's all for tonight. We really thank everyone for joining us and for staying for this little bit that I'm doing at the end um, and we wish you a 